So last week we arrived at uh, slide 38, in fact. So uh, last week was um, essentially all the, um, say the fundamentals, the uh, fundamentals of, uh, you know, what radiation is, you know, the uh, uh, radioactivity, the radiation exposures, the natural radiation exposures, a little bit of details on uh, the effects of ionizing radiation on tissue, you know, divided into deterministics, you know, the threshold effects and stochastic effects, so late cancer induction. And um, today we go a little bit more on the, um, uh, say, uh, application part. So last year we also, um, I mean, last week I also show you um, some live um, detection of radiation with the time peaks uh, plugged into my computer, so I'm not gonna repeat it today. Uh, but you have at the bottom of the presentation the few slides that describes a bit more in detail what time picks is and how it works, what I explained last week. So I think we now can go to slide 39. So slide 38. So last, yes, last week. I think this is the point we got last week. So I can actually now put it full screen. This was the last, uh, the last slide we had, uh, we had last week. And it was essentially uh, the, um, the, uh, we go. The threshold at which you really get a very, very severe damage to the organism. It, now, this week, sorry to interrupt. Is it the maximum sound that you can get? Huh? Or do you speak as close uh, as possible to the microphone? Ah, you have a problem with the sound. Did you hear it, it was not perfect. Yeah, but you said that you had issue. Yeah, is it yeah, well, noise is better? So it, as close. Better? Yes. Okay, so I'll maybe speak a bit closer to the to the computer because I still do not know what the microphone is. I mean, this new laptop. Yeah. Um, so uh, the second lecture we go more into the um, application. So we will see um, the radiological quantities and units which are used in radiation protection. <clears throat> we will uh, discuss a bit uh, in detail radiation protection. So what are the principles? And then we will discuss the um, the, uh, the option you have to minimize the detrimental effects of ionizing radiation that you still need to face for working radiation areas, for instance, for you know, the, the uh, works in the, in the in the nuclear field or uh, particle accelerators. And then we'll, we'll at the end we'll have a little bit of a look at the um, instrumentation that can be used for, um, you know, we use at CERN or we can use in many other labs. I mean, it's just a few examples to, to, um, to measure ionizing radiation. So radiation protection is based essentially on three principles, which are called justification, limitation, and optimization. So the justification is the basic one that says any exposure of person to ionizing radiation has to be justified which in a way is valid for any type of risk. So, you know, you cross the road only if you have to do something on the other side. Otherwise, you know, when you cross the road, there is always the risk to be hit by a car. So you don't really cross the road uh, back or before you have nothing to do. Uh, so, I mean, uh, this is valid uh, for anything. You fly, well, if you need to go from here to there at the, at the fastest pace, then just, just, just walking because flying, of course, uh, implies a risk. It's the same, you drive a car, if driving a car is dangerous, and this is very for, for, for energy radiation. There are a lot of applications uh, which, uh, which uh, ionizing radiation is useful. We will see those for, for the medical field next week, in, in two lectures next week. Um, ionizing radiation sometimes is the byproduct of activities, like if you want to do research experiments with particle accelerators, you have you know, ionizing radiation. As I say, the secondary of what you're doing. Um, so, in fact, exposure of people has to be justified. So, you expose somebody to a radiation level which is above the background, the nature of the ground to which we are all exposed to, and we, we saw last week. I mean, we are all exposed to say two, three millisieverts per year. Depends on whether you have uh, medical exposure, or whether you live at uh, sea level, or you live in the mountains. Uh, depends on the construction material of the uh, of the wood of your house. So we all we all have a natural exposure to you know radon, of course, one of the important components. So any exposure that goes beyond that has to be justified. 
The second very important analysis is the limitation of the, of the exposure. So there are legal limits that must not be exceeded for personnel, for the, for the general public and for the professionals who can be, you know, doctors uh, working uh, in hospitals with x-rays or astronauts in space. They all have, you know, uh, 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 those limits that have to be complied with. And the third one is the optimization. So you have to optimize your work in order to keep the personal doses received by the individual and the collective doses received by a cohort of workers doing forest research and job as low as reasonably achievable. It's the Alara principle. So the fact that you have those limits does not mean that you have to plan your activities so that the, uh, the worker gets the maximum dose that it can be allowed to during the year. No, you have to make sure that you organize your work so that the personal and collective doses are kept as low as possible, including all um, social and economical factor into account because, I mean, uh, reducing doses as a cost. You, you know, if you want to reduce the doses too much, uh, maybe you cannot perform a certain activity that may be important for society or for, or for research. Um, or maybe it's going to cost too much. You know, uh, one example I always give, if suppose you have to design a bunker for uh, a medical Linux and you spend, uh, you know, I don't know, 300,000 euros uh, to build the bunker, to reduce the dose of outside the, the, the shielding to the you know, under microsphere per year, which is you know well below you know the, the legal limits. Now, if you have to spend an additional half a million euros to reduce the dose by five microsievert, well, that's certainly not justified. So it, 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 it goes beyond optimization. So optimization takes everything into account, the social and economical factor. Now. Um, <clears throat> The uh, quantities we are dealing with in radiation protection are of three classes, physical protection and operational one. Physical quantities are the quantities that instruments measure. You can measure the fluence of particle crossing the surface. You can measure the rate, for instance, of interaction of uh, a certain uh, type of radiation with uh, a, a, a gas of, of, of a detector. You can measure the absorbed dose in a calorimeter. This is what you can measure. You cannot measure protection quantities. Protection quantities are the quantities which are designed by, by the International Commission of Radiological Protection to estimate the radiological risk associated with an activity. And it's actually the organ absorbed dose, the organ equivalent dose, and the effective dose. And the effective dose is the reference quantity that keeps, that takes into account, for instance, the um, susceptibility of uh, certain organ to radiation. Some organs are more susceptible to be damaged by radiation than others. And it also takes into account the um, capability of a certain radiation to produce a damage. We saw last week that, you know, photons and neutrons, uh, they do not make the same damage. The same absorbed dose from neutrons and photons is not the same biological effect. And these are actually unmeasurable. You cannot measure them. You can calculate them, but you cannot measure them. So the way you estimate protection quantities with an instrument, finally, is what you need. You need a dosimeter, a personal dosimeter to monitor individual exposure. You need a portable monitor to monitor you know, ambient exposure. And you do that with the operational quantities, the, 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 the third type. Operational quantities are actually quantities which are designed to represent a conservative estimate of the protection quantity. It's something that, again, an instrument cannot measure directly, because remember, an instrument would only measure something physical, but the two can be linked together, in fact. So, in fact, you, you have an instrument which, is, which would measure a physical quantity, and if it's properly calibrated by a proper calibration factor, it will give you an, an, an indication of the operational quantity that in turn will be a representative and conservative estimate of the protection quantity that you should not exceed. 
to which it is in a big volume thing. So first of all, some units, because you need to have units to measure quantities. So the basic unit of the absorbed dose is the grain. Dose, <coughs> uh, as I think I mentioned last week, is energy absorbed per unit mass. So the gra one grain is actually one joule per kilogram. It is a rather big amount of um, dose, one grain. So uh, uh, one grain is to the whole body in one shot would give you some health effects, would not be lethal, but will give you some health effects. So in fact, normally we use the um, subunits, the milligray or, or microgray. The old unit that you still use in the United States, it's uh, the rad, it's 100 rads and one gray. <clears throat> the equivalent dose is actually a quantity that takes into account the, um, the more or less increased capability of create damage by a certain type of radiation. So it takes into account the um, is the uh, is the absorbed dose of organs weighted by the radiation weighted factor of the radiation. So first of all, you might have exposure to one to more than one radiation at the same time. Typical case is neutrons. When you have a neutron field, it is always associated to photon. So you will have a double exposure of photons and neutrons. So the equivalent dose uh, will have to be weighted by the um, the uh, essentially the um, radiobiological effect of the, the given type of radiation in making a damage to tissue. <clears throat> and the effective dose would also take into account the susceptibility of the various organs of the body um, to be uh, damaged by radiation. So the effective dose will be the weighted sum of the equivalent doses and the weight factor are linked to, to body tissue. So that the effective dose is the double weighted um, absorbed dose on the type of radiation and um, type of organ or tissue. So the radiation weighting factor is essentially one, is essentially one for photons, <clears throat> is also one for electrons and neurons as a factor of the energy. It's two for protons and charged pions to account that actually protons and charged pions for the same amount of absorbed dose are given a, a higher um, radiobiology damage. And, um, and, you know, early ions in particle like alpha particles, cesium frangates, early ions uh, has a very much higher weighting factor of 20. For neutrons, it depends on the energy. So it's uh, the radiation weighting factor for neutrons is a rather complex function that can be either plotted in the graph or, um, you know, uh, expressed by, by a mathematical expression and varies according to the neutron energy. So, and it peaks at about, you know, a couple of a million essentially. So the, 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 the radiation weighting factor of neutrons is normally weighted on the neutron spectrum. What is the um, tissue weighting factor expresses, as I said, the radio sensitivity of different organs of tissue. So there are certain organs that are more radio sensitive than others. And um, these tissue weighting factors are actually average values, average over the sex and the age. So if you want to do a very precise calculation, then you have to take into account also of the sex and on the age of the person. But for radiation protection, um, the, the, the average uh, values are adopted, which is essentially um, uh, given in this, uh, in this um, table. So the uh, bone marrow, colon, lung, breast, stomach, and all the rest, which is not in this table, have each of them a tissue weighting factor of 0.12, each of these six uh, tissues. <coughs> Gonads, 0 0.08, uh, bladder, esophagus, liver, thyroid, 0 0.04, and the bone surface, brain, salivary gland, skin, 0 0.01. So you see that this organ actually accounts for practically two-thirds, more than two-thirds of the total contribution um, to, the, uh, to the effective dose. And the sum of this, of course, is one. 
Now, we are now to this thing. Could I invite you maybe as well, Marco, to speak even closer to the... Yeah. So what don't... I'm going to do, I'm going to unplug the external monitor because I have the impression that... Yeah, device... we said that we would do this try, so yes, sorry. We'll try this and see whether it goes better. Thank you. Uh, maybe it takes a little bit of uh, time. Let's see if it goes better because it was trying, I think, to use the um, the microphone in the in the in the other. Um, is it getting better? Is it the same? Everybody can hear better. I can try to speak closer to the to the computer, but um, maybe it should improve. Hopefully, it's better now. It's better now. Yes, yeah, it's better. That's the best you can do. Yeah. Okay. That's this is uh, not Alara. This is as maximum as possible. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so I hope it's uh, clear enough. Um, so. It is clear now. Is it better now? Oops. Sorry. So, yes, it is. Okay. So, operational quantities are the quantities um, on which um, limits are based. As, because as we said, the effective dose and the other thing is that those are not measurable. So operational quantities are defined in order, as I said, to be a representative of the protection quantities on which limits are based and you cannot actually measure. So they should be measurable. You should be able to measure them with an instrument <clears throat> and should be representative so they should not underestimate the equivalent protection quantity. And I'm, I'm only talking about the, 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 so the, the most important one. <clears throat> so for external exposure, we have the ambient dose, the H star 10, and the personal dose, which is the one on which dosimeters are calibrated, personal dosimeters are, are, are calibrated. Whereas for internal exposure, after for instance, an intake of radionuclides by accident, the relevant quantity is the committed effective dose over the next 50 years because you have to take into account that when you in, inhale or ingest something, uh, it de depending, we'll come to back to that later, depending on the uh, um, half life of the radionuclide, the exposure, the internal exposure may last uh, for a couple of weeks or for several years. And to go back to what I mentioned last week, the Easter addition protection. Uh, has shown a big evolution of the limits. If you remember when I mentioned, you know, last last week, in the beginning, soon after the discovery of radioactivity, there was a general belief that the radioactivity was good to the human body. They were actually uh, pharmaceutical, prepared to give you as much radiation as possible. And it was only after, you know, experience has shown that people were actually dying by, by radiation poisoning, that the um, much more attention was paid to, I mean, what to do with radiation and how to protect. So in fact, I mean, the, the original dose limit was, was something which was huge, I mean, you know, severe, something which would be, which is lethal, in fact. So in the 20s, they went down to 700 millisievert, but this is was still, was still very large. This 700 millisievert, essentially, we'll come to that in a second, is the career dose now. So the occupational limit well down, went down, went down, down until in the 90s with the latest recommendation by SRP is now 20 millisievert per year. So if you take somebody who will be exposed to 20 millisievert per year, because that's the limit, and as I say, is very rarely the case, if, if ever, and you multiply by 35 years, which is the normal um, you know, work life of, of a person, you get the 700 millisievert. And in fact, astronauts, they cannot compare to this limit because when you have, you know, I show the dose rates with altitude last week, when you're on board the space station, you have a couple of microsieverts per day exposure, so you cannot really cope with this. So they have a career dose. And the career dose still should not exceed this value. Okay? The annual limit for the public when that was only introduced late in the 60s, has been five millisievert, and now when the um, um, occupational um, exposure for workers went down from 50 to uh, 20 millisievert. The annual public limit went down from 5 to 1 millisievert. So the current limits are 20 millisievert per year for the for workers, for occupational exposed professionals, and 1 millisievert for the general public. 
So the radiologic cover risk are essentially threefold. You can have an external radiation source, so we'll give you an external exposure. You could have contamination risk. You can have a surface contaminated by, for instance, a spill of uh, a liquid radioactive uh, source. You could have contamination of the air. You could have uh, activity in air, so you, for instance, by evaporation of boring oxides, or you could activation of air by operation of a machine. And you, and this could actually end up in internal contamination. So if you inhale or ingest something because you touch the surface with your finger, so when you lick your finger, or you, because you inhale air which is uh, which is uh, loaded with uh, with uh, radioactivity, <clears throat> you may end up with an internal radiation source that will give you an internal exposure that, as I said before, could last for years. So how do you classify personnel? Well, you classify personnel according to their job and to the likely sources of radiation to which they could be exposed. So occupation exposed people are people who by definition could exceed the um, annual dose limit for the public. So if you do not exceed, if you, you cannot exceed because of your activities, one millisecond per year, but then you are not a professional exposed because there is no difference with the members of the public. So if you can exceed one minute per year, then we classify works in two classes. Category A worker can exceed six minutes here per year, so they could be exposed to potentially the maximum of 20 minutes here per year. Category B worker would not exceed six minutes here per year. This is, this is important because in certain countries, you have, uh, for instance, uh, compensation in terms of salary of leave according to the fact that you are category A or B. You also have to classify radiation areas. So radiation areas where people can access and work are typically classified as either a supervised radiation area or control radiation area. A supervised radiation area in an area where the annual dose could exceed one millisievert for normal work. So if you work there regularly, you will get you you can get more than the um, annual exposure of the general public. And this area can be assessed by other worker A or B. A control radiation area in a, is an area where you could potentially exceed six millisievert per year. And that means that these areas are only accessible to category A worker because they are actually classified as people who could be exposed to more than six minutes here per year, or they could be accessed by category B worker, but with time limitation because they should not exceed six minutes here per year. So they could go and work in a control area, but with the restriction in the amount of hours per year they can be there to work in order to make sure they do not exceed the six millisieverts. The exposure situation are what I mentioned before. You can either have a risk of external exposure only. For instance, there is a C radioactive source to which you can be exposed to. Uh, it can be stray radiation from a particle accelerator, can be radiation from a radiation generator, for example, an X-ray tube or a clistron that would emit X-rays or you can have uh, the risk of both internal and external exposure. And this is the case when you use unsealed reactive sources, or where you can be exposed to uh, contamination risk. Therefore, you have to classify the areas. So an area has to be clearly identified and separated. So this is the way we classify areas at CERN. I mean, uh, you know, every lab may have his own, uh, his own uh, type of uh, warning panels, but essentially the concept is the same. So in an area are non-designated, if the um, dose limit in a year cannot exceed the one of uh, the member of the public, and then it's good to have some, some guidelines values that will tell you, you know, that will be used to monitor whether you can exceed the situation or not. So, um, Typically, a working time period is 2,000, is 2000 hours. So typically 40 working hours per day, per, per, per week, times 60 weeks, 
it's uh, it's um, it's 2,000 hours per year. So if you do not want to exceed in a non-designated area one millisiever, well, you cannot exceed 0.5 microsiever per hour in, in any workplace. Again, this would be to reach the maximum that you normally you don't want to reach. But strictly speaking, an area which has 0.5 microsiever per hour, you can spend all your 2,000 working time there. You will not exceed the dose of the general public. If the area is low occupancy, so if people is there only for limited time, maybe for transit, then the uh, this uh, dose rate guidelines may be maybe up to 2.5 microsiever per hour. A supervised area would, um, in principle, give up to six millisiever per year if you were there full time. So if you work there full time, you could be exposed to up to three microsieverts per hour. Because if you multiply it by 2,000, you will not exceed the dose for just ADDP personnel. And again, if it's a low occupancy, you could allow a slightly higher dose rate. Uh, control areas are divided in uh, different subclasses. The simple control area is the one working you know a full working time of 2000 hours per, per year will not give you more than 20 minutes if you have a dose rate in which which would exceed these values then you have to impose restriction so it will be a limited stay area. so you could have access to an area where you have a, a dose rate which could go up to maybe two minutes here per hour, but there would be restriction in terms of the maximum hour, hour you can spend there to work. A high radiation area, a area which you can have a very high dose rate, and this will be a restriction, additional monitoring means to, be, to access control. But again, the work practice must ensure that you will not exceed the annual dose limit. Above this is a prohibited area. You know, any area where you can have more than 100 minutes here per hour is prohibited. You cannot get in, simply. There must be an interlock system that would prevent you to get in if the source is in operation. Okay, now we know from last week what are the uh, detrimental effects of radiation. Now we know the classification of areas. We know, um, you know, are you classified personnel? Well, we now need to know how you can protect yourself from exposure. You don't really want to go into an area without knowing what is there, so you will have monitors, but you, you, you would also need a way to protect yourself. Now, there are three simple means to reduce exposure to external um, radiation. Distance, time, and shading. The easiest thing is distance. The dose rate to which you are exposed to a certain source decreases with the inverse square of the distance for a point like source. The further you go from the source, the less is the dose rate. Time. Of course, I mean, if you spend twice as much time close to a source, by the dose will double. Huh? So you're reducing time, it will reduce exposure to uh, radiation source. And if these two systems, these two approaches do not are not sufficient, then you have to put shading in between yourself and the source. We saw last week that, for instance, for alpha radiation, a piece of paper is sufficient. For beta radiation, uh, plastic is sufficient. Gamma radiation would need uh, high dose material like iron lead, and neutrons would need concrete. So, the mixture of the three must guarantee that the exposure of a worker is below um, the the given limit. And so, uh, we were not going to discuss shielding. If people are interested, we could organize in the future a lecture just on shielding. But these are the three approaches. Um, so, in order to limit the exposure time, you have to prepare your job. So now we go into practical radiation protection. You do job preparation. You prepare all your tools in advance. You know what you have to do before you start doing the job close to the source. If the risk of exposure may be substantially high, you can do what's called a dry run. So you do the same job on a mock-up, which is not radioactive. And then, you, of course, you need uh, monitoring of exposure. You need to have uh, your dosimeter in place. You might maybe have additional monitoring station in place to make sure that you're monitoring the exposure that you are, that you are um, undergoing. But the distance, of course, stay as far as possible from the source. Um, so you have to plan the job so that you can stay as far as, as, as possible. This is 
particularly important, for instance, for beta exposure, because betas are, you know, relatively short range. So between one centimeter and 10 centimeters, there may be a factor of 100 of exposure to beta radiation. So instead of using your hands, use tweezers or tongs, well, they will, uh, you know, keep your hands far away enough that you reduce the, you know, the exposure to it by, by a very large factor. And shielding, of course, has to be designed according to the radiation source. You, know, the, you cannot use paper to, to shield neutrons, and there is no need to use concrete to shield an alpha source. So the material and the thickness of the shield depend on the time, as on the energy of the radiation and of the um, reduction factor you need. So sometimes it's sufficient to reduce the exposure by a factor two or three. So there's no point to put a meter of concrete if you need to reduce exposure you know, to gamma rays by factor two. Uh, you may need uh, a much thicker uh, um, uh, thickness of, of, of the material uh, by, if you need to reduce the exposure by factor 100. Eh? So this is very important to design the shielding according to the radiation you have to reduce, the radiation source you have to reduce, and the, um, so the, the energy and by, and by how much. This is again, shielding design we're not gonna you know, discuss <laughs> in this lecture. So job and those planning is always very important. So essentially you have to lay down your work process, this decide what tooling you need in order to reduce the time you spend in the work hour to be barely necessary. So you might have to prepare tools um, and you might also design, for instance, your equipment that will need to service later on in a proper way. For instance, if you have you know, um, an accelerator vacuum pipe uh, to which you attach a vacuum pump. So you may get activated and you know you might have to uh, replace it from time to time. Well, if your pump is attached to the, uh, to the to, by a flange to, uh, to, the, to, 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 to the vacuum system attached to the, to the accelerator pipe with 24 bolts, then we take out our time to unbolt them all and, 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 and you know, attach a new piece. If it's a, you know, a, a, a flange, which is easy to detach and attach, and it only takes maybe 30 seconds, well, that's certainly better. So, or even at the, I would say even more important at the design stage of your equipment, think if the material can get activated to design the mounting and, you know, and, and disassembly in a way that it can be done fast. So, um, as I said, you can also use mock-ups for complex tasks to, to let you do a dry run, so you know exactly what you have to do when you have to intervene in the radiation area. <clears throat> and you can also use temporary shielding, like the one uh, you know use here. The shielding must not necessarily be to be um, you know um, fixed one. You can actually mount a LED screen on wheels that you can actually put in place. And you can also use remote anti procedures as simple as a tweezer, if you just have to handle a, 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 a beta source, or complex tail manipulator to, to handle remotely, you know, um, you know uh, components that can be substantially activated. Um, for, uh, sorry, for intakes or radioactivity, well, there are also protection means. We can use containment system, glove boxes, fume couples, or radioactive sources which are volatile, must be handled in, in this type of, uh, um, you know, containment. And you can also isolate the person. So the basic rule when you are in a, in general, in a radiation area, even the, there is no risk of contamination, but especially important if there is a risk of contamination, avoid eating, drinking, smoking. So avoid any activity that would risk would be a risk to take something inside your body then the, we have uh, protection means we will see in a, mo a moment gloves uh, overalls uh, and in extreme cases respiratory protective equipment if you really want to be isolated you have the way to do this by wearing essentially a respirator to monitor external exposure you have to wear a personal dosimeter always normally the one at the chest or at the waist. Um, it, was, it has to be read at least monthly to check your monthly dose so you can take corrective measure if you know you are you know getting too much dose uh, which could bring you close to the final exposure. Um, 
passive dosimeter will give you a delayed information and they have a measure with threshold, which is typically rather high to say, so a typical 100 microsieverts per month. But if they are good enough, if you intervene in a radiation area where the exposure is risk is, is limited, so where the dose rates are low. If you have to intervene in an area where you can have a substantial dose rate, then typically you wear an electronic dosimeter that is not a legal dosimeter, so will not be recorded a legal dose, but it will give an instantaneous information on the dose rate and it will issue an alarm, if, for instance, you are getting close to an additional source or if you are accumulating too much dose for the given intervention. And in case you have intervention in which your hands can be exposed, for instance, to beta sources, then you have to wear specifically designed dosimeters that are actually mounted on your fingers that will actually monitor what is your extremity dose. The dosimeter, the personal dosimeter calibrated to measure, to, to give an indication of the personal equivalent dose at 10 millimeter in, in the body, that is the, so the, for deeply penetrating radiation, or at 0 0.07 millimeter, which would be a, 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 an indication of the skin dose. Um, at low dose, which is normally the case, you know, for, you know, we are always, I mean, professional workers, they are always exposed to annual dose, which are way below the legal limits. Um, so it is normally assumed that effective dose and equivalent doses to each organ is equal to 8 to 10, and the dose to the skin is equal to 8 to 10 zero cell. If you exceed the dose limit because of an accident, for instance, then you need to undergo an investigation. For instance, I mean, um, you know, um, it is not frequent, but one of the worst um, accident may happen is with the sources used for industrial radiography on the field, because these are, for instance, iridium source, which has a very strong dose rate because you are doing radiography to, for instance, uh, you know, um, of the soldering of the pipe for, you know, for, for oil. And if the source uh, gets, um, you know, tampered or, you know, it's, it's, it's lost, then you can have a substantial exposure. There are very rare cases, but it did, did happen. And in that case, you probably have to do a deep investigation to reconstruct the, the, the dose at which the person was exposed, maybe with you know, Monte Carlo simulations or maybe doing some specific dosimetric uh, tests. Now, the personal dosimetry has evolved a lot for the early days. On the left, you have the film badge that we used at CERN until well, many years ago. When I arrived at CERN in 1996, we used film badges. And as the name, the name says, the dosimeter was uh, actually had two films, one uh, Kodak film for uh, photons and one NTA films for neutrons, um, assembled in a box that you were wearing on your chest with the different filters, just to discriminate the exposure to different types of um, X-rays. At that time, we did not have electronic dosimeter, so the closest we had were the um, this uh, pen dosimeter, we call them. They were quartz fiber dosimeter that was actually, it was a small ionization chamber within an oscilloscope, within an electroscope, which actually discharging with the, with the um, accrued dose. So we could actually check by looking at the, at the opening of the dosimeter against the light, there was, a, there was actually a scale that you could see that was giving you the, uh, the integrated dose. So this was sort of an uh, active uh, dosimeter you could check every time you wanted. Nowadays, we use the DIS, which is uh, direct ion storage, which is sort of a semi-active. This dosimeter, well, for Newton, we still use a passive one. We use a um, CR39 track dosimeter, which is only read once per year because exposure to neutrons is very, very limited. For gammas, we have uh, this RADOS, which is a commercial one, uh, which can be read at any time in a region. And this is reset once per year. So it's one per year, we give it back and we get a new one. It is recalibrated. So it's set to zero. So anytime you can read in one of these readers, which we have uh, everywhere at CERN, and you get on the display the um, accumulated dose uh, since the last reading. We have to read it at least once a month. 
the data, collect the transcript of the database, but you can read it as much as you want. So for instance, you can read it before and after intervention of the active error to see what is the dose you got during that specific intervention. For intervention in high dose rate error, we have this um, operation of the odometer with the DMC, um, which, we, which has a display, which gives you the dose you are actually getting instantaneously. And we also uh, trigger an alarm if it goes uh, above the limit. And for specific applications, we use finger dosimeter to monitor the, the for instance, the beta dose at, uh, at, at, at your hands. So wearing a dosimeter is obligatory in supervised control areas. You wear it on the chest, you have to read it once a month. Uh, it will give you a continuous measure of the beta gamma dose. Um, the, as I said, you can read it just before or after intervention, and you have to read it at least once a year. Um, this dosimeter, at every reading, the background dose is automatically subtracted. At, at CERN, we have, uh, we assume, which is two microsieverts per, uh, per day. In fact, what I expressed, uh, I mean, what I explained last week is actually very good, 0.1 microsievert per hour. The operational dosimeter is, has to be worn in control areas, so not in supervised area, but in control area where you can exceed the six millisievert per year. It will give you a continuous reading of the beta gamma dose. The resolution is one microsievert. If there's a mistake in the slide, an indigo will change it. You can set those alarms, for instance, at two millisievert or two millisievert per hour, and it will beep. So it will the, the beep rate will increase if you are close to a source. And so you can record the dose before and after the operation to know the integral dose that you have received. So typically, when you enter a, a, a when you enter a um, a control area, you have to um, st start your dosimeter, you put it in a reader, you type a code which is linked to the intervention you're doing. So the dose you receive is actually linked to the type of intervention. I don't know if the action group was intervene, intervene on the waking system or the matching group was intervene on, you know, on a faulty magnet, then you access. And when you go out, you read again, and the dose, it is actually uh, integrated into the database. This is for external exposure. As I said, the other big um, exposure type is um, radioactive contamination. At particle accelerator like at CERN or ESS, where uh, this thing works, this is not much of a problem. I mean, there's more of a problem, for instance, with nuclear medicine department in hospital, which actually deal with uh, liquid. Uh, liquid uh, radio pharmaceuticals, you know, in power station where you might have very high, you know, you know, you know spent fuels or high neutron fluxes. At particle sector, typically you might have radioactive contamination by the use of unseen radioactive source, which for instance said is very, very, very limited. You could have activation of air and dust if you have a very, you know, strong uh, secondary radiation fields. You could activate oils or cooling fluids close to the machine. If you machine, because you have to make a repair, for instance, a radioactive component, you might have, you know, filing or dust, which is then, you know, you can transport, you contaminate surfaces. You could have accelerated emission from target where they are irradiated. But overall, the, this represented activity minor risk with respect to external exposure, but it is still present. It has to be properly monitored. So you have to take uh, precaution uh, in order to avoid exposure of, um, you know, um, in order to avoid sorry, contamination, which could actually lead to internal contamination of unseen radioactivity. And essentially, you have to prevent the contamination of personnel and equipment, because contamination of equipment can lead back to contamination of personnel. So when you go into a accelerator tunnel, for instance, to do an intervention, you bring in tools. Tools, of course, are not radioactive and they cannot get activated during intervention, but they could potentially be contaminated. So it is important you check your tools when you leave an area which could be uh, subjected to contamination. As I said, contamination could lead to internal and external exposure. And if you have any, an ingestion of, uh, um, for instance, contaminated dust, or if you have uh, 
intake by, for instance, an open wound in the skin. So one of the best rules is do not intervene in a red area with contamination rates if you have an open wound or if you have a wound at all. I mean, even if it's uh, not covered by by, by a, a mask protection mean, you could have um, intake. Now, when you when you have the intake of a radon cloud, the exposure, your internal exposure will last until the complete elimination of radon oxide, either by radioactive decay or biological metabolism. So there is a double, there is a double mechanism. And as I was anticipating, the, the determination of the activity that has been taken into your body is assessed by calculating what we call the committed effective dose. There are models to assess that. For instance, if you intake iodine-131, which is an eight-day half-life because you have, you have to get it because of a, a treatment with a thyroid, well, this iodine will be, well, decay naturally by its half-life, but it will also be eliminated by the body. So the two mechanisms will uh, um, work together to eliminate within a certain time the radiation that, that you have, uh, that you have uh, um, taken in. And um, the, so, but the, the exposure, the, ex, the internal exposure can last for, for weeks or for years. So the calculation of the committed effective dose would take into account the dose that you're still getting, you know, until the radon cloud has been eliminated. So there are the ways to measure the, you know, the activity taken to the body. Uh, if it's a beta, sorry, if it's a gamma radiation, you can actually detect it directly from outside. Um, or you can actually um, uh, measure it in the excretum, in the urine or feces. And you can either do screening measurements or uh, do, if you exceed certain threshold, uh, do actual measurement of the intake. So the operational quantity for you know, internal exposure is the, what is this? I don't know what it is. The committed effective dose. I guess um, so. Playing uh, there's right. something funny with playing with the with the part. We discover yeah. different function, I guess. I don't know who, but yeah, please. Uh, okay. right. to... yeah, that was there. Yeah. So um, for the um, regular client with short half life, the dose typically is received in the next few days after the intake. But as I said, for long half life, for instance, you have a particularly unpleasant regular client, which is toned to 90, which uh, thanks to GA by Castle and, and fix themselves into the bones. And once it's there, we stay for maybe years or many years. So when you calculate the committed effective dose, you have to take into account the, 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 the dose that you will receive from this renal clive many years after the, 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 the event. The committed dose is attributed to the period of intake. So it may happen that this dose will make you exceed the annual limit for that year so that your activity in the uh, radiation error will be completely suspended from that time forward. Um, so if, and if actually if the dose is a lot, then it will, you will need to, to, to undertake an investigation, an investigation, maybe it's a metal reconstruction, maybe modeling the Monte Carlo codes of the, of the, of the exposure event. So the, what are the personal protection equipment that are used? Well, it depends on the risk, of course. So if for uh, low level contamination, low risk, you typically wear uh, uh, TVEC overall, which is synthetic paper, which will protect you from, from uh, any contamination of the body. You wear rubber gloves and you wear overshoes. Uh, if the uh, risk of contamination is higher, then you might have to wear a full protection, which include not only the TVEC glove, which will be sealed by tape, overshoes that will be sealed by tape, but you might have to isolate completely from the your environment by using a, a respirator, which will prevent you from breathing the air. Of the, of the environment. There are all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, protection means. Uh, some of this, uh, you know, some of the matches here are actually now used also for the COVID pandemic, but are typically masks that are used for uh, protecting uh, personnel by, for instance, radioactive dust, um, gloves, uh, you've seen that. Um, so individual protective equipment is always mandatory for working area with the contamination risk, as you see here. So for instance, cleaning operation, for instance, you machine radioactive feces, and then you have to clean 
what they have done the machine. So we have to wear protection in to avoid to get contaminated with the, the, the dust or stuff. Now, the last bit I would like to talk a bit about the instrumentation we use for measuring ionizing radiation. So this is the general principle. This is a nice slide that I got from my colleague at the Polytechnic of Milan, I always use it. <clears throat> so remember, if an instrument measure only physical quantities. Physical quantities could be the interaction of radiation in a active medium. So suppose you have a neutron detector, which is consists of a moderator made of polythene with at the center um, an ion chamber or a proportional chamber that would detect the ionization produced by um, secondary particles they will generated by the neutrons, they will end up giving them the day. So a radiation will interact with the, with the polyethylene, will end up in the sensitive volume, charge will be produced, the charge will be uh, collected, amplified, a signal will be produced, and the number will be displayed in the camera. Now, an instrument like this will have this is a neutron device, will have a certain response function versus neutrons. We will not respond to neutrons of different energy the same way. So you must know the response function of the instrument to the different neutron energy would be responding better, for instance, to neutrons around a couple of hundred kV, less to thermal, will respond better or less to, uh, to energy neutrons. Again, if you are interested with, with the Ketavian and Christine, we can set up a dedicated lecture on, on neutron measurements. But finally, um, the, so the, the knowledge, so to say, if you like, the convolution of the response function with a, a, a detected charge will give you a count, which will tell you, a, a, which will be linked to the dose to which you're exposed. There is an instrumented ion chamber, which is essentially a metallic uh, volume, a metallic container, which will have an atom and a, and a cathode. Typically, you could have a cylindrical uh, uh, ion chamber where the, uh, the outer body, metallic outer body is a cathode. A wire in the middle will act as, a, as, as, a, as an anode. And as, as I just showed, the charges produced by, you know, an ionizing radiation, I mean, ionizing radiation is collected because ionizes the medium, so it produces ions. So the charge produced will be collected by the anode of the cathode and will end up uh, shaped by a proper circuit by a pulse, which will be then converted into, a, you know, a, a, into an you know, operational system. Another uh, mechanism to detect radiation is uh, scintillators. So there are certain uh, material which are called scintillators, which in fact, when radiation interacts inside the scintillator, the energy deposited by radiation will produce a very, very tiny light output, something you won't be able to see by eye, but it would be seen by what is called a photocathode. That is a piece of metal which is able to convert light, you know, visible light, into a electrical signal, into electrons. So an event, for instance, that will produce 20 photons, light visible photon in a scintillator, some of these photons will be collected by the photocathode and they will generate, for example, 3,000 ele 40 electrons. So 3,000 electrons. Now, 3,000 electrons is a very, very, very tiny electric current, so you won't be able to do much with that. So after the scintillator and the photocathode, you have what is called the photomultiplier. So the photocathode here is actually followed by an electromultiplier. It will follow by a structure that will collect and guide the electrons to hit a series of electrons. Each of them will multiply so there is a voltage across you know, all these electrodes and the system in design that one electron here will be multiplied and generate many more electrons that will be again multiplied onto the next structure and so on and so forth. So that at the end, you will have a, a detectable current that you can then process into, into an electronic system. 
sorry, it's the other way around. We have to, we have to, we have, we have the lights, we have the, 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 the multiplication stage, and we have, we have the uh, charge collector. Uh, one of the instruments we are using at CERN, the basic one, is a Geiger Miller. You see it is an automass, it's produced by automass, it's a dose rate meter 86, we call it. It's a simply a, a small Geiger counter mounted there inside, the, so the electronic is all, it's very common, it's a handle device. It's very basic, so it's a Geiger, so it would not discriminate, um, you know, photons of a certain energy from another. It will not discriminate uh, gammas from uh, betas. It will have a relatively low sensitivity, so the typical, so it would not be able to discriminate a very weak source from background. The typical range, even by manufacturer, is 0.5 microsieverts per hour to 10 millisieverts per hour. So you will still see weak sources, but you cannot really discriminate from, from background. The energy range of this type of instrumentation is typically between 60 kV, which is the X-ray from uh, Medicium 241, to 1.3 mV, which is the uh, gamma from uh, Cobalt 60, which is one of the, um, say, sources with the highest energy photons that you find in activated accelerator components. As I say, it's very compact. It is a battery power, it's a 9 volt standard battery. It is designed so that we give more or less a constant response in this energy range. And the response is actually, once it's calibrated, it is in, uh, in ambient dose equivalent rate. So we give you microsieverts per hour. Now, the interesting feature of this instrument is that actually you can actually couple it with different probes. So you can actually plug in an external probe, which is um, more sensitive, so in order to be able to go down to discriminate maybe background uh, radiation, you can actually plug in, mount it onto a proportional counter for surface contamination measurement. So this device will use the electronics. It's a proportion, it's, a, it's actually a sealed proportional counter, it is a gas detector with an active surface of 100 square centimeter that is used the electronic 86 but it's sensitive to detect surface contamination. So you can actually add probes in order to um, do different types of measurements. There are devices to monitor contamination. So the typical one we have at CERN is what is called hand and foot monitor. This you find at the exit of any area where you might have contamination. So people stand up on the monitor, they put their feet here, they put their hand there, and in a few seconds, the monitor will tell whether the hand or feet are contaminated. And if you get an alarm for that, then you have to take action. There are devices, there are something there. So you can actually have various types of um, air monitors. Um, Sometimes, I mean, you want to sample the air to see whether you have activation of the air. So there are other uh, system that would sample air on a filter that you have to measure offline. So that will not give you any direct indication on activation in air. Or there are other which will actually um, sample the air and monitor it and give you an immediate uh, uh, reading of the potential contamination from the air. There are systems for all body counting, for instance. As I said, in case of a doubt of an internal contamination by a gamma emitter, you can actually use. A, for instance, a germanium spectrometer or a, a, a big, a large, a large area uh, scintillator, like in this picture here, to actually detect the gamma rays coming from the bottom. So typically, you do that in a in a shielded enclosure, so that you're sure you're not measuring background, and in order to be able to detect the radiation coming out of the person. Um, detection of neutrons is a is a more tricky point. So neutron detection is, as I said, is a, could be the subject of a completely different lecture. But it mostly, I mean, neutron detector mostly exploit the fact that some elements like boron, lithium, and helium three have a very large cross section for slow neutrons. And this is the very large cross section that actually exploited in the fast neutron detection. So boron is because thermal neutrons when they're captured by boron ten. They split the nucleon into two heavy ionizing charged particles, lithium-7 and alpha. 
Uh, lithium, when it captures thermal neutron, we split up in, again, two very high, highly ionizing charged particles, uh, tritium and alpha. And helium-3, when it captures a thermal neutron, we split up, again, a, in a tritium and a copium. So these um, elements are not only sensitive to thermal neutron, but the, this is the cross-section as a function of neutron energy. The cross-section follows the, um, the one over V low. So they are, it, it goes down very rapidly with neutron energy and it's actually maximum at, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the thermal region. So this is what you do. So again, let's have a, <clears throat> a look at what happened. So take again your, your what your, your um, neutron detector, which is made up by this moderator. So what happens is when you have a neutron incoming, well, most of the times you, you won't get a signal. You, the, the, the neutron can be scattered in the moderator and just leave the detector. <clears throat> the neutron may scatter off. He may make a neutron nuclear reaction. It can be captured by the by the material of the moderator and produce a gamma ray that would escape. It would do, do multiple scattering and then again generate a reaction that would uh, give out the gamma ray that escapes. It will simply not interact. And in some rare cases, it will end up inside the sensitive volume. And then if it's, for instance, uh, you know, the boron 10 would produce an alpha. And the, and the lithium-7, which will ionize the gas. And at this point, ionization of the gas will give you a signal. Now, as I said before, neutrons are practically always associated with gamma rays. So how do you discriminate the two? How can I tell that the, 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 the count in my detector is actually due to a neutron and not by a gas? Well, because the signal that neutron and gamma produce is very much different. You know, um, BF3 gas and helium-3 gas make actually neutron detector of slow neutron with excellent gamma discrimination because a gamma ray, what it does, it typically interacts in the wall of the counter, it can be cylindrical, it can be spherical. They will produce electrons. The electron will indeed end up in the gas. They will ionize the gas, but the energy loss of electrons in the gas is very small. So the pulse will, will be very, the electrical pulse produced by this uh, electron will be very, very much different, very, very much smaller than the pulse generated by, for instance, in a boron 10 gas by the lithium 7 and alpha particle that are produced by neutron. So with a suitable pulse amplitude threshold, you can actually cut uh, all the gamma events and only uh, detect the neutron event. And this is how the uh, pulse height spectrum of a, for instance, BF3 proportional counter exploiting uh, boron 10 gas will look like. So if you have uh, an, a neutron that uh, it's actually, that interacts in the middle of the gas and produces the two recoil uh, particles, they, they both brought to rest inside the, the active volume, you will get a peak here. You will get the full energy peak. But very often what it happens is that this event is produced perhaps close to a wall so that one or of the two may escape. So in fact, you will have only a partial deposition of energy in the gas so that in fact, what you will see if you attach a multi-channel analysis, you will see a spectrum like this, where you will actually see the two um, um, shoulder correspond to the fact that one or the other has left the gas. But really, it doesn't matter, but what counts is the integral of, under this curve. And the integral will, will give you the, the actual number of neutrons which have interacted. And the gamma rays, the signal again of the gamma ray will be in this corner. So if you put in your electronics a threshold to cut all these events, you are sure that these are events only due to neutrons. These are a few examples of neutrons that rank count, which is the classical um, detector used for uh, um, measuring the ambient dose equivalent rate due to neutrons. They are all based on the concept of a moderator, which is made of polythene for neutrons, to detect neutrons up to about 10 MeV, or polythene with embedded uh, IZ material like lead or tungsten to be able to discriminate uh, 
you know, um, ING Newton, for instance, the, this is the uh, cathode ray view of the, of the Eberlein 1D2, where they had a tungsten layer, because in fact what happens, you know, Newton up to a few minutes will simply be slowed down in the, in the polythene, and, we, and some of them will example a thermal neutral in the, in the detecting gas in the, in, the, in the middle, which is I said is typically either BF3 or AB3. A neutron of a 50 MeV, what it will do, it will not be thermalized, for instance, it will not be detected here, but it will interact, some of them will interact with the tungsten. They will undergo inelastic scattering, and one ING neutron may produce a few neutrons or a few MeV, which will then be thermalized by the residual polythene, and again, end up in the, in the, in the gas and thermal view. So for this, you need to know exactly the uh, response function of your Newton detector. So there is the, the count per unit fluence at the different energies, and that is properly calibrated. For environmental monitoring, this is the last bit, the last few slides. Um, we have, uh, this is what we do at CERN, but it's done essentially there is a general practice. We have either active monitoring or passive monitoring. Active monitoring is to monitor the ambient dose rate in certain areas. In, say in the environment outside the, you know, the radiation areas. We measure all the water which is released from CERN to make sure there's not contamination. We monitor all the air which is extracted by chimneys and ventilation system from you know, experimental areas or atleto tunnel to make sure there's no contamination in the air. We monitor weather parameters to see whether, I mean, the, you know, the air extraction is in that time. And we also have gain monitors to monitor um, radioactivity may be taken out of the site by, by, by the same car, for instance. And then we have a set of uh, thermal management dosimeters for passive monitoring. So environmental monitoring, we typically have a straight radiation monitor. So we have, um, you know, small hatches, which contain typically um, um, ion chambers and rain counters to monitor stray radiation, gamma and neutron, or we have uh, uh, polythene moderator with inside a pair of lithium six, lithium seven dosimeter to monitor. Typically, they integrate over one year. You know, so you get the annual dose at a certain position of by gamma and neutron. Uh, say every place where we extract air from a certain tunnel, they have um, an extraction system that flush the air through um, ion chambers that count. Uh, you know, potential contamination. Water is the same. We sample the air. We had uh, either, you know, online monitoring at the extraction point. And we also sample, uh, for instance, grass or, or dirt around the, you know, the, the countryside to make sure there's no radioactive contamination in it. And we have an environmental laboratory that actually uh, measure uh, stuff. Uh, so stray radiation is typically monitored, as I said, by rain counter and, and ion chamber. Uh, these are installed in the accelerator tunnels, in the experimental areas, and they're actually meant to protect workers in areas adjacent to accelerator tunnels or in experimental areas if there is any um, event that would generate prompt radiation above a certain uh, uh, value. They would also give alarms. When the beam is off, you don't have uh, prompt radiation anymore, but you, you will have residual radioactivity. So before you access an accelerator tunnel for maintenance, we have ion chamber that will actually monitor the um, residual radioactivity and will tell the worker when it is safe to, to enter. This all can be uh, monitored by remote. We have uh, um, large volume plus scintillator installed at each exit that will detect if a truck or a car is bringing radioactivity outside, not declared. You can, of course, transport radio radioactive component from one side to the other, but you have to have a, a proper authorization to do that. If you try to do without this, this model will get it and you will get a, an instantaneous um, 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 alarm on site. Um, this system will give you, well, we have system also installed in a certain tunnel to give uh, an audible and visible alarms, which will be, you know, by one of these three lights uh, in case of exceeding pressures. So typically we'd have a green light if the situation is normal, 
you will have a door in light with the sound if uh, you know you have some abnormal radiation level detected and it will give you a red flashing light and the sound uh, with you also evacuate the area if some accidental situation would produce a too high radiation level. And finally, as I said before, throughout the sun site and the countryside, we have uh, thermoluminescent and dosimeter, which are read typically once per year, and they're used to get to keep to get a picture of the overall um, you know influence of sun in this case on the environment. And I think I will stop here because the last slides is just a list of some textbooks that you can go and have a look and read if you want to have uh, more information. Very good. That's also very important as well to have those textbooks uh, and those references. I hope the sound was good enough. I think so, Juan. So we didn't have further complaints. So sorry if this was not perfect, but at least I think that um, this is the best that uh, we could do with this equipment. So I think it was very comprehensible. So do we have any questions already? So you can feel free to type them down or just to wave so that we can ask you to speak up. Everything was crystal clear. Can we, can we hack using the mic? Or? Please, that would be, you're more than welcome because sometimes it's easier to explain the question. Sorry, thank you. Good day, Dr. Marco Solari. From it's well, I'm used to everybody. <laughs> I'm a friend and also a family. Uh, I wish to ask about uh, the explanation on um, uh, the controlled supervised area, taking the medical linear accelerator into consideration. Are we taking the bunker as the control? control console, and then the patient within area. I, I want you to help to group this. Where do we use for controlled, uh, supervised, and does the patient within area, is it part of it? Normally, the way you classify areas, areas as I said, it depends on the potential exposure that you can have uh, to make work. Normally, I think it's good practice not to have uh, a public area directly adjacent to a control area. It's always good to have uh, sorry, a supervised area and then the control area. In hospital, it depends. Clearly, I mean, the um, hospital is a bit uh, of a um, specific uh, situation because you have a bunker yes. where you will have a patient being treated, but during with be mom. And in that case, of course, that would be a for sure control area. The important thing is that uh, no one else has to be in the room except the patient, of course. When the beam is off, that area becomes supervised. So you can actually also change the classification of the area <clears throat> according to the radiation source which is present. It's a typical case for accelerator. I mean, at CERN, the accelerator tunnels are prohibited areas when the beam is on. You cannot physically get in. You know, the access system is such and the interlock system is such that will prevent somebody to be in the tunnel when the beam is on. So the air is prohibited. When the beam is off, then you have to monitor, and then the air is actually turned into a control area, or it could be a supervised area, depends on the you know radiation level. What of, what of the control console now? That's a supervised area, right? It depends where you put it. Now, the, this is a typical example of Alara. So if you could put the, your control console in a, in a position where there is no dose rate produced by the operation of the accelerator, then that can be in a non-designated area. The people who are there, they not even be to, need to be radiation workers because you are not exposing them to, to any radiation. If the control console has to be close to the bunker, maybe attached to the outside shielding, then you might get some stray radiation during operation and then has to be in a supervised area. Okay, okay. I think I'm, I'm, I'm clear about that. It's better than that. So, I mean, remember the Alara principle, try to avoid exposure unless they're really necessary. 
Definitely. Thank you very much, sir. So do we have any other question? So maybe one, one shot as well to, to try to make sure as well that uh, everybody is uh, Okay, you spoke several times about the, the, the thermal neutron. So, and I was just checking for the slides. Uh, you didn't have the definition or the different rate for the hot neutron, thermal neutron, cold neutron. So, do you want to? Yeah. Okay. So, what so do they the, could potentially yeah. see? So, typically, the, you know, okay, depends what, uh, you know, you can do a Monte Carlo simulation, you know, and simulate the spectrum to the, you know, very fine detail. But typically, I mean, for, say, for radiation protection, you can distinguish the neutrons typically in uh, uh, slow. So thermal, thermal energy, you know, is the, the one that corresponds to the thermal, um, you know, movement uh, at ambient temperature is 0 0.025 electron volts. But typically, you talk about you know thermal neutrons or you know fractional electron volts. Then you talk about, say, um, epithermal neutrons, which is sort of a keV value. Then you have the intermediate neutron, which go up to say <clears throat> the MeV or under, under kV. Then you talk about fast neutrons, which are up to a few MeV. And again, and this is what you normally encounter except at a high energy accelerator where you also have high energy neutrons which are above 10 meters, and for which you need specifically designed instrumentation. Because as I, as I mentioned, if you take a rank counter, a conventional one, which only has polythene, well, you won't be able to monitor neutrons above 10 MeV. So if you use a, you know, a, a thermal counter for normal, uh, say for neutrons up to 10 meters, and you want to measure around uh, an high energy accelerator which can have neutrons up to a 100 MeV, but you might end underestimate the dose by factor. So, the knowledge of the neutron field is important in order to select, well, in general, the knowledge of the radiation field is important in order to select the most appropriate instrument to be used. So, that's one of the things you need to really try to understand what is the range and then to try to have the, the best equipment. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you don't want to use a, a film, I mean, a, a film for, 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 for gammas to monitor neutrons because you use measure zero. Exactly. And what would you think, Francis, in terms of the, um, the best cost effective um, detector that uh, could be used, for instance, in a hospital or to try to. So, same way, it's a bit the same question. You have first to understand what dose is. But for a given, well, it, it depends what you want to, to monitor. As I first said, at CERN, for the basic uh, radiation surveys, we need the, this automatic AD6, which is not very expensive. I, don't, I can't tell you the cost, but the basic AD6, I think, is less than a thousand euros, I think. Yeah? And that's good enough if you know if you're going around and do, and do a search. Now, if you want to discriminate for background, but that's not sufficient. Then you need to, to plug in a probe, which is, uh, for instance, um, for instance, there is this, what is called the ADB, which is a very big uh, probe, which is a large volume, I think, um, plus a scintillator. And this we use it, for instance, because for instance, one of the work that we're doing at the moment, and again, it could be a, be a spot for another lecture if people are interested, we are doing um, radiological clearance of material. That mm -hmm. is Switzerland, like some other countries, they have, uh, uh, thresholds for dose range, contamination, and specific activity. So, uh, Becker per unit mass per radionuclide below which, so if you satisfy the three conditions, a material that has been exposed to radiation on an accelerator can be classified as non radioactive. It can actually be sent off, actually sold, which is metal, as a scrap to be reused, to be recycled by society. Now, to do this, we are actually running since five years a number of projects on this. We have cleared nearly 1,000 tons of um, material, mostly still from left, but not only from left. And it is extremely important that you do this measuring extremely precisely. So you cannot use an 86 to decide whether, because for instance, in Switzerland, the, 
the um, the uh, criteria for clearance for the dose rate you should not ex your object should not exceed 0.1 microsievert per hour at 10 centimeters above background so if you use an 86 they're not sufficient and we are actually much stricter we measure in contact and we decide that something is not radioactive only if it does not exceed background which is typically 60 70 nanosievert per hour by 30 nanosievert per hour so you need a very very sophisticated instrumentation for that we use the 86 but we don't use the 86 as such we plug the adb which is an automess large volume probe which would discriminate you know 10 nanosievert per hour so it really depends on the application and of course, if you want to send something out to some object, you have to be extremely careful. Okay, very good. So we have a, a question from uh, Timotop, so asking, so if there anything like tissue weighting factor for the neutrons? In, uh, no, um, radiation has radiation weighting factor and tissue as the tissue weighting factor. We have, we have in these two slides. So the tissue weighting factor tells you the susceptibility of a certain tissue to radiation, irrespective of the radiation. So we know, for instance, you know, the, the, the eye, we respect the heart, we respect to, to, to the, the, the liver. The potential damage that radiation can make to a tissue is expressed by the radiation weighting factor. It will tell you, for instance, the neutrons are according to the energy are more capable of doing radiation damage to a certain tissue whatever the tissue then photons because of the way they interact with matter because photons interact with matter by producing electrons which are sparse and ionized radiation neutrons will interact with matter producing for instance recoil protons which are densely ionized radiation you can you can create much more ionization per unit track length than photon. Very good. That was not a question. Okay. Uh, maybe yeah, another potential question. So waiting that uh, we can have more. Uh, you were describing in this uh, 20 millisieverts, for instance, being one of the, the limit at CERN over the, since the 90s more. So it's really interesting to see over the time how it evolved. So this is in Europe, so does it depend on European directive or yes. stay in America? What is it in Africa? Yeah. So uh, actually CERN has always been, uh, um, if you like, ahead of the other countries because we, you know, we, we have uh, France and Switzerland as host states. So we always take the most restrictive legislation from the countries. So for instance, while France still had 50 millisievert per year, wow. we already adopted 20. Now in Europe, I cannot tell in the, in the US, but in Europe, the system works like this. You have the ICRP, the International Commission on Radiological Protection and ICRU in the US. And the ICRP emits, um, they, they collect the scientific data and they, emit recommendations, which are actually um, in reports. Now, in Europe, the European Union receive the uh, recommendation by ICRP, for instance, to lower in what has happened recently is to lower the dose to the, the, the annual dose to the, to, the, to the length of the eye, which was uh, um, 150 millisievert, it was used to 20 because of the latest scientific finding. So the EU uh, you know, uh, receives this recommendation and and emits a directive. And with the, the directive, within a certain number of years, the each member states of Europe has to comply. So the, the national legislation must adopt the European directive within a certain number of years. So it doesn't mean that, I mean, some country could have uh, the more or less freedom because this, as you said, this is the national that will decide. So they could take those, yeah, European directive or international, but it's uh, a, a limited duration. So meaning that the law can change, that's one thing, but they have to, this, I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't know that. It depends. No, it depends if you have new scientific findings. So I mean, for instance, um, you know, 
the um, the uh, old directive was suggesting you know, the 50 millisiever per year annual limit. It was adopted by by you know by the new directive. They meet the recommendations. Then later, when when ICRP suggested to lower the annual limit of exposure for workers to 20 millisiever, this was received by the European Union. They emitted a European directive specifying, I mean, among many other things, to lower the, the to lower the limit, and then the, each country adopted international law. Okay. They have to adopt the recommendation of the European Union, and including the national legislation for many, for, for, for many different things. Eh? And Switzerland does the same, but even if it's formally not uh, European Union, they, they, I mean, they do the same. Okay, very good. So for the last uh, two minutes, so we have one question speaking about uh, Monte Carlo as well. So a question from Simon. So talking about Monte Carlo simulation, are there free software for X-ray uh, spectrum simulation? Sorry, sorry, I, 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 did, I didn't pick up. Free software, some open source software that would exist ah. for the X-ray um, Well, for instance, at CERN, we use um, uh, Fluca, you know, huh? And now you know that we have two fluke, eh? INFM fluke and some fluke. And this is typically for academic use, is uh, you have to get the license, but it's free. If you want to use it for commercial purpose, something else. MCMP from Lozano, that's not free. Even CERN had to pay for a license. But fluke, you get your, and I think Giant is also free. I mean, you do yeah. not need to, to pay for a license. And Mars as well, huh? Mars huh? at Fermilab, this is what we were using. The, yeah, so it was the, the, Mars against Luca. It, dep yeah, it depends on it depends on the on the on the institute to, who releases it. Uh, uh, I think some of them are uh, for free, some are uh, you know you have to pay for license. Yeah, but Mars would be as well for free. So I think it would be interesting, Simo. So if yes. you want to, to see some of uh, the yeah. The, the result and, and to connect as well with CERN or, or Familab to have those free yeah. access. Yes, Fluca, Giant, uh, FIT, uh, that is developed for uh, particle therapy by the Japanese, they're all uh, free. Mm -hmm. In the sense, you have to download from the website, you have to sign an agreement that you're not, you know, using it for illegal purposes, you're not modifying, you're not modi for instance, Fluca, you cannot modify the source code, um, but after you sign the agreement, you can, I mean, Fluca can runs on your uh, laptop now. Eh? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> actually during ASP, the past ASPs, uh, we had uh, mm -hmm. extensive uh, hands-on tutorial both in Giant and also in Fluca. So, uh, Simo, I think uh, you can you can take a look at uh, at uh, the agenda for ASP 2018. Yeah, I think there will be some some instructions there where you can download uh, Giant for. Um, ASP 2016 agenda, for example, has an extensive uh, has some tutorial in, in, in Fluca as well, and so so I think if you go back to those those materials or those uh, you know the the agenda for for the previous ASPs, um, you can have a lot of information there to start with. That's right. about Giant, but the Fluca as if you go to the Fluca website. Um, they, uh, sorry, I haven't had a meeting now, so they're calling me. I will, I will go back to them. Um, for Fluca, if you go to the Fluca website, you have, where they run training courses every year, you have all of the slides of the training courses available on the website. Maybe also Jan. Okay, very good. So I think that uh, we went over the the time of uh, all the topic that we wanted. So thanks again, Marco, for this uh, very interesting two lesson. And the next two will be as interesting as this as well. So looking at application on medical yeah. side. So looking forward to that. So this will not be on Thursday. The first one will be on Tuesday. And then the next at one. At four, I think. It's Tuesday at four, I think. Huh? Is it four? Because we wrote four. Yes, Thursday. yes, yes. It's, uh, the Tuesday one is. Uh at uh, 4 p.m. Yes. CERN time, and the Thursday one is at 4.30. Yes, exactly. So make sure you get it on time. You get it okay, at 4. So okay. we'll, uh, we'll send the, the right record. So thanks again, yeah. Marco. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope it will be useful. That was fine. Thank you. It was useful. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Marco. Bye. Bye-bye.